Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Maryam Al Abdullah, and this is our second lecture on class three malocclusions. Our reference is chapter 11 from An Introduction to Orthodontics, fifth edition, and chapter 13 from Contemporary Orthodontics, sixth edition. Last lecture, we talked about different, different terminologies uh, that applies to class three malocclusions, epidemiology, etiology, different features of the malocclusion, and basics uh, for treatment planning. Uh, this lecture, we're going to talk about the management of this malocclusion. Uh, as we said last time, we have main categories uh, and treatment options uh, for this malocclusion, starting with the interceptive treatment, graft modification, or accept the incisor's relationship with no treatment, or accept the incisor relationship with uh, minimal aims of treatment, camouflage, and surgery. Starting with the interceptive treatment, as you know, interceptive orthodontics in general is an early orthodontic treatment that is applied uh, to children in the mixed dentition in order to reduce the severity of the, of the developing malocclusion or to, co to completely uh, correct the malocclusion. Uh, this applies to certain scenarios in a class 3 malocclusions. Patients with unilateral buccal crossbite with mandibular displacement. This is an important condition that requires immediate treatment as soon as it's being diagnosed because this is a functional shift of the mandible. Anterior crossbite with anterior mandibular displacement, what we call pseudoclass 3. Usually these patients are presented with the class one skeletal pattern or mild class three skeletal pattern. Uh, sometimes the displacement of the mandible is not only anteriorly or laterally, it, it could be both. For example, this patient here has an anterior and lateral displacement of the mandible to the left. So we have anterior crossbite and unilateral buccal crossbite. The last scenario is when the patient is presented with instanding incisors but the skeletal pattern is, is usually normal or, or minimal class 3 and no family history of class 3 malocclusion. Right, so the first scenario, unilateral buccal crossbite, although there is weak relationship between the mandibular displacement and temporal mandibular joint dysfunction, but we still don't, we, we should not, never leave a patient with a functional shift as soon as the mandibular displacement is being diagnosed in the mixed dentition, it should be treated. If the patient in the permanent dentition, then this is not an interceptive treatment anymore. This is too late. This is part of the comprehensive orthodontic treatment. When we say interceptive, that means it's an early treatment. Now, what happens if no treatment was provided is that the patient will develop habitual mandibular posturing and asymmetric muscular activity. Now, in cases of bilateral buccal crossbite without mandibular displacement, the general dentist should not uh, start any treatment because bilateral buccal crossbite with no mandibular displacement is usually stable. If you don't succeed in the treatment or for any reason you stopped in the middle, you might convert bilateral buccal crossbite into unilateral buccal crossbite with mandibular displacement. So you're going to introduce harm to the patient and this will increase risk for the treatment. So any patient with bilateral buccal crossbite, please refer to the specialist, especially if the patient is still growing and there is uh, a chance of unfavorable growth for such cases. Now. This is an example of a patient in the mixed dentition, unilateral buccal crossbite with mandibular displacement to the left. Okay, so the treatment of choice is usually simple removable appliance, midline expansion screw. So as you can see, the expansion screw is positioned in the middle because the problem is an overall narrow maxilla. It's not a problem on one side only. So the midline expansion screw should be in the middle. It should not be on the closer to the uh, problem side. It should not be closer to the left side, for example. Okay, If the patient is presented with a unilateral crossbite without mandibular displacement, and this was a genuine asymmetry, then we can go for expansion, unilateral expansion of the problem side, one side only, Okay, which is not the case for this scenario. 
Here we have mandibular displacement, so we have to go for symmetrical expansion of the maxilla using midline expansion screw. Are there other options? Yes, of course, we can go for quad helix. We can go for uh, other uh, appliances. It depends on how much expansion we want, type of tooth movement, uh, age of the patient, um, the, uh, the skeletal problem that the patient has a narrow maxilla or tapered teeth. So all these will affect our treatment choice. Patients with anterior crossbite. If this case was not treated as soon as it was diagnosed, we will have attrition to the labial surface of the upper incisors. We might have some fracture or mobility of the incisors, upper or lower, because this is a traumatic bite. We can have gingival recession, as you can see here, we can have gingival recession on the lower labial segment. Usually the aesthetic is compromised and the patient will develop class 3 profile. The more teeth that are involved in the anterior crossbite, the more severe the case is, the more difficult to treat. What are the options for management? Again, we have simple removable appliance. If it's a single tooth that is in crossbite, then we use the spring 0.5 millimeter stainless steel wire. If it's two adjacent teeth, then we use a bigger Z spring. We call it double cantilever of 0.6 millimeter stainless steel wire. And if it's more than that, we usually use anterior expansion screw. If there is in addition to the crossbite rotation and crowding, then we can go to what we call two by four fixed appliance system. Fixed appliances that does not involve all teeth. It involves two, that means two bands on molars and four, it means the bonding the four incisors. So two, two by four fixed appliance system. So this is an example of a patient with anterior crossbite. He presented in the mixed dentition and the treatment was simple. It was a removable appliance with a Z spring in order to correct the crossbite on the upper right central incisor. What happened is that we took the records, we took the impression, we delivered the appliance, but the patient never came back. Actually, he came back in the permanent dentition. So just to show you the consequences of having no treatment, you can see the gingival recession on the lower incisor, and of course, there, there is attrition on the labial surface of the upper incisors. Mobility, uh, risk of fruit resorption also exists. So this is a patient with a single tooth in a crossbite. The treatment of choice, as we said, removable appliance with the Z-spring of 0.5 millimeter stainless steel wire. And that's it. The patient is in the mixed dentition. Our aim is to correct only this single feature of the malocclusion, and then we we'll leave the patient under review to continue and to complete her dental development. When she is in the, in the permanent dentition, then we plan our uh, comprehensive orthodontic treatment if necessary, if needed. Okay. The stability at the end of the treatment after correcting an anterior crossbite, as we said last lecture, is very much depending on the amount of overbite. We love to have average or increased overbite. Here, the patient is presented with minimal overbite. So what happens is that we keep the appliance nighttime only for three months, three to six months for retention after correction, okay? If the overbite was average or increased, we don't need retention. We just leave the patient with no appliance after correction. This is another patient with two adjacent teeth in crossbite. So the design is, a uh, removable appliance with double cantilever of 0.6 millimeter stainless steel wire. So we correct this specific feature of the malocclusion and you can see there is improvement in the, uh, in the lower incisors because of the uh, correction of the cross pipe in the upper. And there is also improvement in the gingival recession. As you can see, it is reducing. And after that, we just leave the patient until he's in the permanent dentition and we go for the comprehensive orthodontic treatment. Right, cases with pseudoclass 3 malocclusion, as we said, uh, is, uh, are cases that are presented with uh, anterior crossbite and anterior mandibular displacement. Usually the skeletal pattern is a class 1 or mild class 3. Uh, no family history of class 3 malocclusions or prognathic mandible, and the overbite is average or increased. If all these features are there, then a successful treatment result is almost guaranteed. 
So this is a patient with pseudo class three, as you can see anterior cross bite, anterior mandibular displacement and lateral mandibular displacement to the left. And since it's not one tooth or two teeth, it's more than that. So the design is a simple removable appliance with anterior expansion screw. The idea of showing you such cases is to have different scenarios so you will know the management and you will have an idea about the design of your appliance. So this is an anterior expansion screw. Usually the patient activates the appliance himself twice a week. Uh, every turn is 0.2 to 0.25. A millimeter so twice is almost half millimeter a week so continue expansion until the cross bite is corrected and actually you can have a look at the center line the center line was deviating due to mandibular displacement as you correct the premature contact and you correct the anterior uh, cross bite what happens is that the center lines are coincident because the mandible is now positioned in the central occlusion after that, we leave the patient to develop, to, to finish his uh, dental development, and we can consider uh, a second stage for expansion to correct the rest of the uh, buccal crossbite as necessary. Okay, is the removable appliance the only option for anterior crossbite? No. So this is uh, the case that we saw last lecture, a patient with pseudo class three, because when we asked her to bite her anterior teeth edge to edge, she was able to do this. So basically this is anterior mandibular displacement. And the case was corrected using two by four appliance. And this is the patient at the end of the treatment. So we just correct this feature and we remove the appliance and we leave the patient to continue her dental development. I should not keep the appliance four to five years until all the deciduous teeth have uh, are, are replaced with permanent teeth because this will compromise the dental health uh, and it will compromise patient's compliance. So we only have an interceptive treatment with very limited treatment aims. And once it's done, we just we, we stop. We finish the treatment, we go for retention and we leave the patient. We review the patient every six months to check the dental development. So you can see that the patient started with mild class three, but at the end of the treatment, you can see that this is a class one because the mandible is now in the center of occlusion. There is no mandibular displacement anymore. Now, what about growth modification? Cases with a class three mild occlusion, growth modification should start before pubertal growth spurt. This is different from growth modification uh, related uh, or targeting class two mild occlusions. Class 2 malocclusions, we usually target the uh, mandible and we wait for the growth spurt. But for uh, class 3 malocclusions, the patient should be younger and uh, usually the patient is still in the mixed dentition. And the principles of a growth modification, as you know, is based on the functional matrix theory. We aim to change the soft tissue envelope where bones are positioned, and this should modify the growth and lead to remodeling of bone and change the direction of, gro of, of growth, but not really the, the actual amount of growth, because this is determined genetically. So the patient should, to start off with, of course, have skeletal discrepancy, and the patient should not be beyond the adolescent growth spurt in class 3 malocclusions. The aim of the growth modification or what we call orthopedic treatment is to enhance and to encourage anterior maxillary growth, restrain or redirect mandibular growth and control vertical growth. Now, evidence suggests that in short terms or mid terms, there is a good success results. In long term, there aren't enough results to have um, a, a final uh, point of view about the success of the treatment. If treatment is carried out prior to the pubertal growth spurt, then there is a good chance of success result. So growth modification can be achieved by differential growth of the maxilla relative to the mandible. We can use different appliances. We can use protraction headgear or what we call face mask. We can use bone anchored maxillary protraction or a combination of one and two. We can use chin cup or functional appliances. Protraction face mask, also called protraction headgear or reverse pull headgear or face mask. Okay, so all these refer to face mask. 
uh, it's different from the conventional headgear. It's not, this is not a headgear. It's a protraction face mask, protraction headgear, or reversible headgear, okay? This appliance will, uh, is an extra oral orthodontic appliance that will apply forces that are generated from extra oral sources, and they are transferred intraorally in order to enhance forward growth of the maxilla. So this is the basic principles. The basic components are a forehead piece that is attached, attached to the forehead and a chin piece that is attached to the chin. And then we have a metal framework. This metal framework could come uh, around uh, the face at the lateral border of the face. So we call this design delayed type face mask, or we can have one single rod in front of the face and we call this rail style face mask. As you can see, both designs will have um, uh, a place where you can position elastics. So you position the elastics extraorally, and then you connect these elastics to a hook that is positioned intraorally. Okay. So what happens is that these elastics are trying to push the maxilla downward and outward, and what the reaction is the forehead piece and the chin piece is being pushed toward the face. Okay, so it's like stabilizing the appliance. Action and reaction. Intraorally, these elastics could be held by removable appliances or fixed appliances. So as you can see here, this, these are the elastics and this is the hook that is attached to the band on the molar. It could be, as we said, it could be removable. Again, these are the hooks where the face mask is attached. These are the hooks, usually the hooks should be positioned between the laterals and the canines. Again, these are the hooks from uh, a fixed appliance uh, in order to provide an attachment for the face mask. So the elastics that are used are supposed to give amount of force of about 300 to 600 grams per side. And as we said, the attachment is usually positioned between the lateral and the canine, as you can see here, between the lateral and the canine. And it's, it should be directed about 20 to 30 degrees below the occlusal plane. This is the occlusal plane. It should be below the occlusal plane, 20 to 30 degrees. Among, uh, the number of hours that the patient is supposed to wear this appliance is 14 hours. So it's like evening and all night. Evening and all night. Okay, the evidence showed that patients under 10 years of age will have about 70% success rate with positive overjet at the end of the treatment. And these studies followed the patient about 15 months, around 15 months, but we don't have uh, results that uh, followed the patient more than that. There isn't enough evidence. So some research were suggest that uh, using rapid palatal expansion can actually enhance the effect of the face mask. How? Well, the face mask is trying to pull the maxilla forward and the maxilla is attached to the rest of the craniofacial structures through sutures. So what the rapid maxillary expansion is doing is disturbing these sutures uh, with, with its heavy upropped forces for opening. Usually the patient, when, when, when they use the rapid palatal expansion, they open it twice a day for about 21 days. So this is a lot of disturbance to the craniofacial structures. And this, in theory, is supposed to enhance the anterior uh, uh, enhancement of the maxillary growth through the use of face mask. So uh, researchers would suggest that you can use rapid palatal expansion even if the patient is not having a narrow maxilla or buccal crossbite. So you can use it. And uh, if the patient is having a narrow maxilla, then you just use it to open. If the patient is not having a narrow maxilla and no transverse problems, then the patient can, can open it and close it, open and close on and off just to disturb these sutures and to enhance the effect of the face mask. So this is a patient wearing a Deleur type of face mask. And as you can see, these are the elastics. There are two ways to go for the elastics, directly from the left to the left hook, from the left extraoral hook to the left intraoral hook, uh, again from the right intraoral hook to the right extraoral hook, or we can go uh, across uh, opposite sides. And the reason why sometimes we use this because these elastics sometimes do um, uh, disturb the corners of the mouth. Okay, they can use some ulcers here um, if these hooks are a little, a little bit wide. 
So as you can see, the force is coming extra orally and it's trying to pull the maxilla outward. So these are the hooks where we apply the elastics. Uh, as you can see, these are elastics that are going directly left to the left, right to right, and uh, they, they should not. Uh, it's important to make sure that they are not disturbing the corners of the mouth. Right, so the best case for the use of face masks are cases with, uh, with a skeletal class 3 malocclusion in relation to the maxilla. So the etiology is a retrognathic maxilla because this growth modification aims to enhance the forward growth of the maxilla. So to start off with, we need to have class 3 malocclusion with a retrognathic maxilla. Uh, ideally, the patient should be from, 10, uh, from 8 to, to 10. And we need to have upper incisors that are upright or retroclined, but not proclined to start off with, because as a side effect of using face mask is to procline the upper incisors. OK, so we don't want them to be proclined from the beginning. Also, the effect of having a face mask is to rotate the maxilla, resulting in opening the vertical dimensions. So. Again, to start off with, the patient should have average to reduced vertical proportions. It's not really a good indication for patients with long faces and increased vertical proportions. So what's the effect of the use of face mask? Again, we're trying to move the maxilla forward. As the forces are going underneath the center of resistance of the maxilla, what happens is that we will have the maxilla going forward and a little bit of rotation, counterclockwise rotation, anti, sorry, anti-clockwise rotation. Okay, and this will result in hanging of the molars downward and it will result in opening the maxilla mandibular plane angle and it will increase the vertical proportions. So the overbite will be reduced or even we will end up with an anterior open bite. Now, uh, another effect of the face mask, as you can see, so, so the red line here represents the, the forehead, the uh, metal rod, and this is the chin part. So this is the face mask. It's, it's trying to pull the maxilla forward. And um, uh, also as a result, uh, the upper incisors will be pulled forward. They will be proclined. And the mandible uh, will be affected by redirecting the growth of the mandible downward and backward. Okay. Now, when we pull the maxilla forward, the whole sutures where the maxilla is connected to, to the craniofacial facial structures will be affected. But for the mandible, when you try to push the mandible backward, what happens is that we don't have sutures. We have condyle. So the condyle and the glenoid fossa will be affected by this force and we might have some bone remodeling and we will have change in the direction of growth of the mandible, not the length of the mandible. And this is why the patient to start off with should have average to reduce vertical proportions. This is an example of a patient who presented with a class 3 malocclusion. So this is a true class 3 malocclusion. It's uh, where we need growth modification. The problem is um, uh, the patient is having an anterior open bite, but it's part it's partially related to partially erupted upper incisors. Okay, so we went for face mask to improve the skeletal pattern, as you can see, and the patient was uh, good. She provides she actually presented with good compliance, and we ended up with a positive overjet and improve over by it only because the teeth were partially erupted so we were uh, that was not part of the treatment the effect of the face mask on the contrary the effect of the face mask is to increase the length uh, of the uh, vertical proportions the lower facial height okay so the upper incisors are proclined the maxilla is being pulled forward and the mandible will rotate backward and downward now, the second option is bone anchored maxillary protraction for growth modification. And this is relatively a new technique. And it's the use of screws or mini plates. So this is a model. And you can see these screws are positioned in the maxilla in the posterior part of the maxilla, in the mandible, in the anterior part of the mandible. And the only part that we can see intraorally are these hooks, small hooks. And we ask the patient to use elastics. 
So it is, uh, although we still rely on patient's compliance, but it is, uh, let's say, maybe easier for the patient to use. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the this is an invasive procedure. We need surgery, okay? Um, in addition to the elastics, the patient could also add face mask to these hooks to enhance the effect of uh, the growth modification effect. So we need surgery to position the mini plates in the upper uh, arch uh, all the way at the back and in the lower arch all the way to the front. And then we raise a flap, we close the flap, and at the end, we only see these small hooks coming out intraorally. Right, so this is uh, a case from Profit. As you can see, the patient is using elastics for growth modification, and at the same time, the orthodontist is applying fixed appliances, bodily movement, and opening of space, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you can note that here, uh, the although the the case is finished and the appliances were removed and there is very good correction of the malocclusion, yet the mini plates are still in place. Why? Because we always worry about relapse in patients with a class three malocclusion. We worry about the unfavorable residual growth. So if this happened for this patient, we can always go back to elastics. So we, we can always go back to wearing elastics to counteract the effect of this unfavorable growth. So this is to show you uh, bone anchorage with face mask only, no elastic. So what happens is that we place the mini place in the anterior part of the maxilla um, and, uh, and this is replacing the hooks that are used with removal appliances or fixed appliances. And we ask the patient to apply the uh, elastics from the face mask to these, to, this, to, to, to these hooks, to this part of the mini plates. A third option are chin cups, okay? A chin cup, as you can see, is, uh, has a head cap component and a chin cup component. And in between, we have an elastics to apply the force. Okay. The idea is to modify the growth of the mandible by rotating it downward and backward. Again, the force that is applied by this appliance does not, is not transferred to a suture. It is transferred usually to the condyler's head. And what happens is that the condylar head and the glenoid fossa will have uh, a little bit of bone remodeling and there will be direction, redirection of the mandibular growth downward and backward. So the patient to start off with should have uh, reduced vertical proportions. And now, uh, the problem with this appliance is that you cannot control the direction of force. Uh, unlike the face mask, the face mask is attached to the maxilla, and the maxilla is a fixed part of the craniofacial structures. But the mandible is always moving around during eating, talking, swallowing, during function, and the direction of force is always altered according to the position of the mandible. We try to direct it toward the head of the condyle, but usually it goes a little bit below the head of the condyle. So the, the effect of such forces are variable according to the effect uh, or to the place where it is really directed. Again, the effect is rotating the mandible downward and backward with reducing the overbite. And in addition, because this chin cup is pushing the, up, the, the lower lip backward, this will also mold the lower incisors and they will be retroclined. They will be retroclined. Okay, functional appliances. You talked about functional appliances in your class two malocclusion lectures, right? And it is used to modify growth of the mandible. In class three malocclusions, functional appliances are rarely used. Why? Because the functional bite is difficult to be registered. So if you imagine a patient with a class two malocclusion, and you ask the patient to bite edge to edge, there is a bit of easy easiness when you, the patient is trying to bring his mandible forward because there is a wide range of movement of the mandible forward. On the contrary, in class three malocclusions, if you ask the patient to bite edge to edge or to try to bite his mandible backward as much as possible, there is a very limited range of movement of the mandible. How much can you bring your mandible backward? 
the difference between centric occlusion and centric uh, relation is about one and a half to two millimeters on average. So this is the max that you can get, and this is a little bit difficult to register. Nevertheless, these appliances can be used in mild cases, patients with mild class 3 malocclusions, and we expect the effect of uh, uh, proclining the upper incisors, retroclining the lower incisors, enhancement of forward growth of the maxilla, and restraining the, uh, the growth of the mandible and redirecting its growth downward and backward. Uh, an example is Frankel 3 functional appliance or reversed twin block functional appliance uh, that can be used for class 3 malocclusions. Now, the third option uh, for uh, among our treatment options in class 3 malocclusions is to accept. Like any other malocclusions, if the case is mild, if the patient is happy and satisfied with his profile and occlusion, or if the patient is persistent, is, is, is uh, presented with uh, persistent poor oral hygiene, or he is not willing to comply with your treatment options, then it's best to provide no treatment. Just accept and go for no treatment. And this will require extensive patient's communication and education. On the other hand, if the patient is having mild class 3 malocclusion, uh, reduced but positive overjet and reduced overbite, and the patient is satisfied with his occlusion and his profile, or if the case is really severe but the patient refuses surgery, then we can go for simple treatment aims, what we call compromised treatment. Compromised treatment is just to go for a line and level the arches, and that's it. We are not aiming to correct the incisor specification and the molar specification, etc., etc. We just go for limited treatment aims because we cannot correct the malocclusion if it's really severe and the patient refuses surgery. This is not magic. You know, orthodontic treatment is not magic. Uh, so these cases, we accept the incisor's classification, we accept certain features of the malocclusion, and we just go for alignment. And this is an excellent example of a patient who presented with a class uh, 3 malocclusion. Um, as you can see, the patient's chief complaint was a buccally displaced upper right canine. The lower incisors are really retroclined. The incisors are class 3 malocclusion. The molars on both sides, on the left side, it's half unit class 3. On the right side, it's a quarter unit class 3. So correcting the malocclusion in the upper and the lower will be difficult without uh, any, um, uh, let's say, surgery or, or any other methodologies. The problem here was that the AMB was minus 0.7. So this is a class 3, moderate class 3 skeletal pattern. And the problem is a prognathic mandible. The lower incisors are 83 and a half, which means they are really retroclined due to the dentoalveolar compensation. So there is no further retroclination that could be possibly uh, applied. So for this patient, we really have to go for compromise treatment, accept the skeletal discrepancy, accept the incisors classification, and just go for upper arch orthodontic treatment only. Okay. And as you can see, the, we, we expanded the upper arch because of the crossbite, we aligned the canine, and we reached our treatment aims were fulfilled, we reached to the end of our treatment. So this is the patient at the end of the treatment. And I want you to notice here the, the start molar relationship. It was a quarter unit class three, and we did nothing to the lower arch, as you remember. What happened is that the patient at the end of the treatment was presented with a full unit class three. So this is a total of four to five millimeter of advancement of the mandible. So what happened is that the patient did continue to grow. She was about 13 when she started her treatment. So she did continue to grow unfavorably. And luckily we were able to align the canine and to stop the treatment with an acceptable acceptable incisor relationship, as you can see here. So this is a less severe class 3, and at the end of the treatment, she, the patient did present with a moderate uh, uh, class 3 malocclusion, a more severe, let's say, class 3 malocclusion. Right, camouflage. Camouflage is to accept the underlying uh, skeletal discrepancy 
in the anterior posterior in, in the vertical dimension and just go for correction of the rest of the features of the malocclusion. OK, and the stability of such treatment will very much rely on the amount of overbite and the amount of growth, if there is any, because we said if there is any growth that will remain, usually it's unfavorable. Of course, camouflage is more efficient by using fixed appliances than removable appliances, and any extraction should be avoided until we finish with our expansion and proclination of the upper incisors, and then we reassess the need of extraction. We don't extract first in the upper arch at all. So how can you camouflage? As, as you know, this is the same as what the soft, what the, what the um, uh, soft tissue uh, will do, which is molding the teeth. We try to procline the upper incisors, we try to retrocline the lower incisors, or both, in order to correct the malocclusion. Now, when do we choose to procline the upper, the upper labial segment only? Again, if the patient is presented with a class 1 or mild class 3 skeletal pattern, if the upper incisors were upright or retroclined, but not to start off significantly proclined. And if the over, overbite is average or increased, because as you can see, the black line represents the tooth before proclining. The blue line represents the tooth after proclining. As you can see, proclining of an incisor will reduce the overbite because you're going to be swinging the tooth upward. So this will, this will reduce the overbite. So to start off with, we need to have average or deep overbite. If we have crowding in the upper arch, we need to assess need for expansion and we need to go for proclining and then assess, reassess the conditions and reassess need for extraction. We try to avoid extraction as much as possible for such patients, especially young patients who still have some potential growth because usually this will be unfavorable. Now the expansion, it's important to know that if you expand without any fixed appliances fitted on the teeth, uh, then you will have pure tipping of the buccal segment, and this will cause swinging of the palatal cusps downward. And this will result in uh, reducing the vertical dimensions, reducing the overbite, and compromise the stability. To avoid this, it's important to expand you in addition to, fix, uh, to, to, to be having fixed appliances fitted on the buccal segment because the fixed appliances will have a torque, lingual torque. So this will control the uh, expansion uh, and we have to use uh, rectangular uh, arch wires in order to uh, express this lingual torque that is uh, already exists within the prescription of the brackets and the bands. Okay, so it's important to go for expansion when the fixed appliances are there and the rectangular arch wire is fitted. So this is an example <clears throat> of a patient presented with a class 3 malocclusion, and this is a typical case to correct using proclining the upper incisors only, because the upper incisors are upright, they are not proclined, and the overbite is beautiful, it's deep overbite, and the skeletal pattern is mild, it's not that severe class 3. So this is a typical case to go for proclining the upper incisors. As you can see, this is correcting the incisors classification, we had to terminate the treatment early due to patient's poor oral hygiene, but, but as, as you can see, the skeletal pattern, the, sorry, the incisors classification was corrected to class one. <clears throat> now, if the patient was in the mixed dentition and he decided to go to procline the upper labial segment, it's extremely important to check the stage of development of the permanent canine. If the permanent canine was far away from the roots of the incisors, then you can go safely proclining the upper incisors as the root will go a little bit palatally, but it will not come in touch with the developing uh, canines. But if the canine is close to the roots of the central incisors, then we have to delay the treatment until the canine is erupted, until the canine erupted. Otherwise, we will carry the risk of root resorption for the incisors. So this is an example of a patient in the mixed dentition, uh, anterior crossbite. As you can see, what if one of the canines is almost erupting, the other one is a little bit high up vertically. It's actually impacted. So we were able, after the eruption of the uh, right canine, we were able to go for brocl proclination. 
When we reach this stage, we have to go for another OBG. And this OBG, as you can see the difference, now the canine is closer to the roots of the incisors. So now we have to stop, wait for the canine uh, to uh, normalize, and then uh, after extraction, of course, of the deciduous, uh, we extracted the deciduous C, and now we're waiting the, for the canine to normalize, and then we go for a second stage of fixed appliances, open space exposure, and then align the canine. So this is the patient at the end of the treatment. Now, with reclining the lower labial segments, as you can see here, the black line represents the original position of the lower incisors, and the blue line represents the position of the new uh, newly retroclined uh, lower incisors. So when you retrocline the lower incisors, the overbite will increase. The overbite will increase, and this is good. Okay, sometimes extraction of lower C's at the same time may allow lingual movement of the lower labial segment, but you need to assess the space condition in the lower uh, arch. Uh, of course, if you correct this in the mixed dentition, and the patient continue a little bit of unfavorable growth, what happens is that these lower incisors will be trapped behind the upper incisors and it will help with the dental alveolar compensation. So this is a patient who had no treatment of the cross bite. The lower incisors were, were not retroclined behind the upper incisors and the patient continued unfavorable growth. So what happens is that the mandible and the lower incisor will be brought forward and the further and more severe reverse overjet will be produced. On the other hand, a patient who had the anterior cross bite corrected early, if the patient continued to have unfavorable growth, what happens is that the lower incisor will be trapped behind the upper incisors and uh, we will have good dental alveolar compensation. So this is a patient who presented with class 3 malocclusion. As you can see, the, lower, the anterior cross bite was not treated early and the lower incisors were uh, were not retroclined, and this is, and the upper incisors are actually of average inclination or even a little bit proclined. So this is the excellent case to go for retroclining the lower incisors only. So as you retrocline the lower incisors, what happens to the overbite? It will increase. So this is beautiful. This is reduced overbite, proclined lower incisors unspaced, and this is retroclined upper in lower incisors and average overbite. So this is a good result. Uh, using retroclination of the lower incisors only. What happened is that the mandible also relaxed, the lower lip also relaxed to a more favorable position compared to the previous uh, before treatment. Right. Um, we use retroclination of the lower labia segment if they were already proclined or upright, but not to start off being retroclined. If overbite is reduced, because as we said, if we retrocline the lower labia segment, the overbite will increase. This is an advantage. And if the skeletal pattern is mild to moderate class three, and if there is no further unfavorable mandibular growth is expected. Retroclination of the lower labial segment, of course, means that the lower incisors will occupy a narrower arch. That means we need space. And retroclining, as we said, will increase the overbite. So this is a patient with a class 3 malocclusion. The upper incisors are of normal inclination, but the lower incisors are slightly proclined and the overbite is reduced. So the best thing to do is to go for retroclination of the lower labial segment, and this will enhance the overbite and correct the incisor's classification. Now, sometimes during fixed orthodontic treatment, we can use elastics. We use class three type of intermaxillary elastics, and these are connecting hooks at the back of the maxilla all the way to the anterior part of the mandible. Okay, so these are called class three intermaxillary traction elastics. And the effect of these elastics is to mesialize and to move the, buckle, the, the upper arch forward, the, all the whole teeth, the, the upper incisors and the upper molars forward, and it will move the lower teeth backward. So it's a combination of both action and reaction, okay? But at the same time, it will, due to this direction of movement, this is a, not a pure horizontal force. So what happens is that the mandible might uh, drop down and uh, compromise the vertical dimension. So it's important to control the vertical position of the molars to avoid reduction of the overbite. 
So this is an example of a patient where we used class uh, three elastics. What happens is that we're trying to retrocline the lower incisors and this will enhance the overbite as long as we are controlling the vertical position of the molars. So these are the features that favors orthodontic camouflage treatment for patients with a class three malocclusion. The skeletal pattern class one or mild class three, minimal dental alveolar compensation to start off with. If there is anterior mandible displacement, then this is even better, and we will have better success rate and easier treatment. If the patient has having average to increase over five, this is excellent for stability. And if the patient is past the adolescence growth spurt, then this is good because any potential uh, remaining of growth usually is unfavorable. So this is an example of a patient with anterior crossbite. Luckily, the patient can bite edge to edge. So all these features that the patient is presented with tells us that the patient is having good success rate. The, the, the skeletal pattern is moderate. This is not mild. This is a moderate class three. And we went for camouflage, except uh, skeletal discrepancy camouflage. And uh, as you can see, we corrected the anterior crossbite. We used some mini screws to move the posterior segment. And this is the patient at the end of the treatment. So you can see her profile is much improved. There is better support of the upper lip because the upper incisors were hidden behind the lower incisors. Now the patient is having better support for her upper lip and a more relaxed position of the mandible. Finally, we go to the surgical option to correct class three malocclusions. Before any permanent teeth extraction, before any appliances fitted inside the patient's mouth, it's important to decide to go surgery or no surgery. We cannot start and then reassess. Why? Because the tooth movement to go for no surgery is totally the opposite to tooth movement to prepare the patient for surgery. If there is no surgery, then we go for dental alveolar compensation, which means that we try to procline the upper incisors, we try to retrocline the lower incisors, and we might extract some teeth in the lower. But if the patient is going for surgery, then we go with what we call dental alveolar decompensation, which means try to normalize the position of the teeth before surgery. And this includes upper incisors retroclination and lower incisors proclination. And that might include extraction in the upper arch. So this is totally different. The treatment is totally different between the surgical cases and the non-surgical cases. So it's very important to decide on this before we start any orthodontic treatment. There are no hard rules whether to go for surgery or not, but patients with an A and B of minus four, less than minus four, is considered severe. Uh, a patient with the lower incisors being at 80 degrees to the mandible, that means a lot of dental alveolar compensation. That means the case is severe. If there is a strong family history of a class three skeletal pattern, this is again not favorable. This will favor surgical option. If the overbite is reduced or there's an anterior open bite and the vertical dimensions are unfavorable and increased, again, this might favor surgery. If the patient is not satisfied with his profile, it's very clear that the patient's chief complaint includes the look of his profile, the look of his big mandible, the look of his dished in mid face. Then this again will direct our treatment towards surgery. And of course, we always look at the clinical findings and alongside with this, we go for cephalometric analysis and a proper education to the patient with multiple sessions to discuss the treatment options with the patient. So it's like extensive communication sessions with the patient. Now, the surgical procedures to correct class three malocclusions might include single jaw, for example, advancement of the maxilla or sit back of the mandible, or it can include a combination by maxillary, by max. So both jaws are included in the surgery. So we can have advancement of the maxilla. And sometimes if there is, if there is vertical problem, we can go for impaction of the maxilla. The, the impaction could be symmetrical, or we can have more posterior or more anterior impaction, depends on the case. And then we can have bilateral split of totemy for the mandible to set back the mandible uh, with autorotation according to the uh, changes that we made to the maxilla. OK, so planning the treatment is important before the uh, surgery. 
uh, before the, the orthodontic treatment. Usually we start orthodontic treatment and this lasts about um, nine to 12 months before surgery. And then after surgery, we continue about six to nine months to, norm to finalize the occlusion. So this is a case with severe class three malocclusion complicated by steep mandible, huge amount of maxillum and dipolar plane angle, as you can see here. The patient chief complaint is her mandible, her profile. So this case was obviously a surgical case. We had to go for retroclining the upper incisor, so we extracted the badly destructed six on the upper uh, right quadrant and a five on the upper left quadrant in order to be able to normalize the upper arch. The lower arch, we needed no extraction because we had to go for proclining the lower incisors. So as you can see here, we retroclined the upper incisors. We proclined the lower incisors and the patient looks worse before surgery. This is normal. So this is a cephalogram before, exactly before surgery. And this is, this is the patient after surgery. All right, so um, afterwards we normalized the occlusion and this is the patient before she had her bridge and this is after she had her bridge. So this is the different treatment options that we usually have for patients with a class three mild occlusions. And it can range from interceptive treatment, graft modification, accept incisor relationship, camouflage or surgery. Thank you for listening.